if you are an African and you are watching this video, it is most likely that you've ever thought of going to Dubai. In this video, I'm going to show you a clip whereby after watching this, you will have double thoughts about going to Dubai and you'll never step foot again in Dubai. Let's dive into this video and see why. It is crude. It is offensive. And it's ugly. In the Arab world, racist depictions of black people are rampant. <laughs> and the use of blackface is rife. Black people are routinely cast into subservience playing servants, prostitutes, or they're shown as straight up objects of ridicule. Anti-blackness in Palestine. Hey guys, I'm coming to answer a frequently asked question that you asked in my last video about being black in Palestine, specifically if I experience any anti-blackness there. So some very quick background. Of course, I lived in six countries. Palestine is the fifth country I've ever lived in. I lived there for seven months as a teacher in the West Bank. Um, and overall, as a black woman, I can say that Palestine is by far the safest country I've ever lived in. I can touch upon this in another video. And people are the friendliest and the most open-minded I've ever um, met in any country that I've lived in. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, I can safely say that I was never scammed there, right? So if I ever bought groceries or things like that, you know, fish, whatever the case may be, I was never given like a higher price um, because it's obvious that I'm an outsider, right? And what usually happens is that people think that you have more money um, and that, you know, that causes them to raise the price for you. But I paid what the Palestinian person paid um, and very often they would give me like a little bit extra as well, I think, you know, just to be nice. Also, whenever I went clothes shopping, I was also given the price on the tag. Sometimes I would even get a discount as well. And shopping there is actually quite great. I got the best jeans of my life there and um, some coats I can show in other videos as well. Um, people just always gave a deal. Like, you know, it, they didn't scam me. I was never followed there. I was never harassed there by men, never cat called or anything like that. Um, I never felt unsafe, you know, whenever I, you know, walked into an, an alley or something like that. Um, another thing is, you know, me being an outsider, clearly, um, people would engage me in conversation all the time, asking me where I was from. Um, and then just from that conversation, I was asked to come to their house to, uh, to have dinner a lot, a lot. Um, and I actually have footage of a dinner, Palestinian din dinner that I went to that I can also make another video about, of course. Um, and overall, to be honest, there were no issues. When I initially went there, I was told that I had to dress modestly, you know, cover up tattoos and things like that. But after a while, I learned that there are a lot of people there who wear jeans, who, who dress in a very modern, casual way. Um, and so I started doing the same, showing my tattoos. I even wore a crop top at one point where my stomach was showing. And maybe I would get one or two glances, but nothing ever happened to me, nothing negative. No one ever yelled at me on the street. I have not, I did not have one negative experience with a Palestinian person ever during my entire seven months in Nablus. I have a lot of wholesome stories that I can tell, of course, make other videos on. But I, I also knew, you know, a few words in Arabic that were derogative for black people. I never heard any of them ever, ever. I have nothing bad to say about Palestinian people and how they treated me as a black woman ever during my entire time there. I'm a firm believer in if somebody is speaking about their personal experience, right? For example, if I'm talking about a, something I experienced as a black woman and you are not black and you can't contribute to the conversation in a productive manner, just listen. It's okay to just listen. So I recently made a video about um, three, exp three racist experiences I had in Dubai the second time I was there, right? After having a great time the first time, right? I never said in that video, do not go to Dubai. I never said Dubai was a racist place, actually. I was just sharing my experience as a black woman, right? I'm seeing non-black people explaining to me as a black woman that the racism I experienced is not possible because they've lived in Dubai since, since before Jesus Christ was born and they've never seen anything like that before. So I'm wrong. Dubai? They're Dubai, they're Dubai, they're Dubai. It's the most inclusive place in the world. So I, I must have made it up. 
I'm Ghanaian, right? I don't think Ghana is a racist place. If you came to Ghana and experienced racism, though, in no way, shape, or form would I ever tell you, oh, no, you, that can't be possible. Ghana, my Ghana, my Ghana, my Ghana. No, because I don't have control over everyone in Ghana. Anyone can do whatever they want, including be a racist. <laughs> Turning now to a practice, a problematic, anachronistic one that keeps cropping up in modern media, blackface. White or light-skinned people caricaturing those of African descent by darkening their faces with theatrical makeup. It's a supposed entertainment device from a bygone era. And while across much of the Western world, it no longer features in mainstream art or entertainment, in the Middle East, you don't have to go back in time to find this stuff. Blackface and caricatured depictions of black people still go out on the air, and in most cases they are not even seen as offensive, particularly in Egypt, which is home to a sizable Nubian minority. There are so many, way too many things that they aren't saying about Saudi Arabia. Um, I've moved here now. I joined my husband um, about three months ago. I'm Nigerian, I'm African by blood, by ancestry, by everything. Same with my husband. Um, yeah, there aren't so many things that are being talked about. The media doesn't push about Saudi Arabia, especially as a black woman, as an African who, you know, just joined my husband. My husband has been here for a year now. And I'll be sharing some of those things with you guys. Number one, they don't really tell you guys how much safer it is living here compared to some of the Western countries um, most of you brag about. Yeah. UK, US, Canada, Australia. You can literally walk 12 a.m., 1 a.m., 2 a.m. at night here. It's, in fact, the life of the party here is nighttime from evening till 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Is as if it's during the day. Nobody's talking about that. They also don't tell you guys as much as the box women as being, you know, I don't know, the way you guys make it out to seem, the way I read heavily before coming here, and I was so scared of coming here. They don't tell you guys how much women are valued here, how much they are protected, how much they are pampered. Quickly, so. I've lived in Dubai for almost eight years. I did my high school here, my national diploma, my bachelor's, my master's here in Dubai. I had my child here, everything. And every single time I've been disrespected in this country, it's been coming from the low budgeted Arabs. By that, I mean it's coming from the Egyptians, the Lebanese people, the Iraqis, whatever, the other Arabs that are not Saudi, Kuwait, UAE, Bahrain, Qatars. It's the other low, broke, budgeted Arabs, you know? Those are the ones that discriminate black people in this country, including the Indians, who I'm categor categorizing with Pakistani, Bangladesh, whatever, that community. It's always your people that discriminate black people and make Dubai look like it's racist and they discriminate against black people, but it's coming from the low budget Arabs and the Indians. Why are you so comfortable to do that? But my mom had told me that um, that I was mixed race. Mm -hmm. And she told me that my dad was an Iranian man. Okay. And so, I mean, at seven years old, six, seven, when you're in first grade, you're just kind of like, okay, I don't even know what that is. But a little bit older as I got, I did some research, you know, to see what the Iranian people looked like. I was very fair-skinned. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like I didn't have, like, any certain features that looked like anything really so i was like okay that's what my mama says i am right that's what i am my birth certificate still to this day says white <laughs> so um you know so that's that, that's that's what i went with yeah um it wasn't until i was 16 years old that my mom told me i'll never forget it i'm driving her um we're going our, on our way to um, my school it was during the summer and she was like, baby, I have to tell you something. I'm like, okay. Like, what do you have to say? And she's like, your dad is really black. I said, he's really, huh? She's like, yeah, so you're actually mixed with black and white. And you look more and more like him every day. And so I can't, I can't lie to you anymore. Like, your dad's black. 
so I have a running joke now like so many things happen just in culture and everything um and I'll be like yeah that was before I was black <laughs> before I was black <laughs> that's yeah. before I was black I don't know anything about that <laughs> pre-black era now that must have been a hard concept for you because what you and I have talked before and and we've talked about like in depth how your family wasn't necessarily racist yeah um but they did believe in kind of races staying to themselves. Yes. It's not like I hate you. It's like, oh, we're cool, but I'm not sure that white and black people should mix. And yes. you heard that your whole life growing up. So absolutely. how did that affect you? Like, what were your thoughts in that moment that she told you you were black? I think in the moment, I was too stunned to speak or mm -hmm. think. Um, but in the coming months... I really, now looking back at it, I believe I really went on like an identity crisis spiral. Yeah. Um, because what do you mean I'm this thing that I've been told that we don't intermingle with and I am the intermingling of it? Mm. Um, how, how am I supposed to move forward when, you know, to this point, the, the white boys that I maybe liked or thought was cute or whatever couldn't date me. And the black guys that I was kind of feeling like maybe were cute because, you know, it was pretty much those only were their only races really where I grew up. You know, it wasn't a, a huge, diverse, you know, place, but it was like they're kind of feeling me, but I don't I didn't think I could be with them. Mm. you know so I was really in this because y'all didn't because I wasn't with supposed to intermingle. Yeah. Um, and so finding this out, I was like, oh, well, I can date black guys now. <laughs> and I went off the deep end like I I'm feeling talkative today but I just came across a TikTok that said some Arabs are more racist than white people and like yeah let's talk about that let's talk about how my aunt called me Shirley Led when I went to Lebanon let's talk about how they tell me to stay out of the sun because I'm already too dark let's talk about how I want my best friend to come with me to Lebanon but I'd rather spare her a terrible experience let's talk about how if I fell in love with a black guy and married him how hard that would be for me, how hard it would be for him, how many hurdles we would both have to jump through, how I really wouldn't want him around my extended family because I wouldn't feel comfortable and he wouldn't feel comfortable. It's, it's really gross. Maybe we should start taking some accountability and stop denying it. Black Egyptians who originate from the southern end of the country or from northern Sudan. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now on the persisting troubling use of blackface and the stain that leaves on media outlets in the Arab world. Hello Africans, I hope where you are, you're doing fine, and um, if you're not doing fine, please do fine. It's, it's always good to be fine. It's never good to be unfine or to be unhappy. Yeah. Now, today let's go all the way to Dubai, the United Arab Emirates. Yeah. Dubai is the capital city of the Arab people, the Muslims, the Arabs. You know, by the way, each year... Muslims all over the world walk or sometimes they take um, camels or sometimes they take airplanes and they go all the way to Mecca. Mecca is a city in um, Saudi Arabia where we have a, a place, this, this thing where uh, Muslims go there and uh, they worship. Each year, yeah, there's a pilgrimage all over the world to Mecca. And sometimes many people die along the way. Yeah, sometimes it's tough. But you know, if there is people who protect their faith, it's the Muslims. And I respect them for that. Yeah. Now, speaking about Dubai, there is something about Africans and um, the Arab people and the Arab countries. We understand that the, that the Arab countries are very rich. They are rich in minerals. And this has made them to be the most rich people. You understand? Uh, Arabs have money. These guys have money. You see, the tallest buildings are found in Dub are found in the Arab countries. The Burj Khalifa is the tallest building in the world, and it took billions of money to construct that. It was built uh, by an Arab emir over there. So many uh, Kenyans have sought to go over there and work. They have sought to go there and work because. Uh, the Arabs are really paying well and uh, they love this. They really love this. You understand? So 
Africans are going over there because they don't have a way of um, making things meet uh, back here in the country. I understand if I were in that position, I would have thought, actually I once thought of going to Dubai myself uh, to go and work there. There were times I was facing lots of difficulties. I normally thank God I didn't go to Dubai. And here is why. Many people, many Africans, let me use Kenya, have, uh, have succumbed to difficult situations. Many have even succumbed to death in the hands of these Arab people. You know, Arab people, some of them are not so good to black people. As you understand, our, uh, Kenyans, uh, Africans, and any other black person, we are not liked all over the world. If there is somebody who is a, a common enemy, it's always the black person. The black person is a common enemy, and uh, we can't agree less. You understand? Now, there is this concept about uh, racism and slavery. Let's put away slavery. Let's deal with racism. Many people, if we talk about racism, we always think of the West, many people that is. But I tell you this, the Arabs, some of them are also racist towards black people as well. Black people are always going there, but they keep their eyes closed to the racism. Some are able to tell the stories of their racist uh, encounters in those countries. Some keep quiet. Like the video I'm about to show you is a video of a Muslim girl, uh, an Arab girl actually, uh, who is telling her story uh, based on her experience with her own people. You know, she's an insider and she's giving an inside job, an inside secret. Yeah, we, we love it when a person from inside realize that they've been doing the wrong thing all along, but now they want to correct the wrong things. That is it. When we talk about slavery now, we normally think of the triangular trade. But there's another slave trade that took place. The triangular trade took place on the western side of Africa. The slave trade I'm about to tell you, it was called the Indian Ocean Slave Trade or the Arab slave trade. The Arab slave trade did, did take place in Africa. It did happen. But many people don't know about the Arab slave trade. Arabs were even worse than the white people. They would come here, abduct Africans. Some were even being sold to them. They were taken all the way to Oman. Oman is a country in the, in the Gulf. It's an, it's, it's a, it's, it's an Arab country. The capital city of Oman is called Muscat. Yeah. I think here there's a lot of cats in Muscat. In Muscat, there's a lot of cat. It's an old town. They like preserving their culture. You don't have skyscrapers in Oman. You don't have that. But you have black slaves over there. They've decided to retain their culture and all that. Now, slave trade did take place in East Africa. And it was conducted between Africans who are betrayers of fellow Africans with the Arabs. In this video that I'm about to show you right now, it's of a girl. Um, she's giving her experience as an, as an Arab who, who has faced uh, this. Uh, she has seen how much her people have done to black people. And uh, she's explaining this. In this video that we are about to watch right now, uh, this woman is going to discuss the issue of racism in the Muslim and Arab world, uh, which is a very sensitive topic in this modern day and age. She's, uh, she as a creator also shares personal experiences of witnessing racism in these uh, communities, but note that it has never been directed towards them. It's always been just racism towards the black people. Uh, there is also a mention of contrast of skin tone between uh, different regions. You understand? Highlighting the diversity uh, within the Muslim Arab world. Now, the video is also referencing the historical uh, figures like the Prophet Muhammad's companion Bilal, uh, who, was f who was a freed slave and called to prayer to discuss attitudes towards race in uh, Islam. It's good that Islam do not accept the issue of, tra issue of racism because uh, from this video, the woman is explaining that even their own prophet, Muhammad, married a freed slave. So racism is not a part of Islamic culture. I love that.
Now the creator also emphasizes the importance of addressing racism and speaking up against it. And if it may be comfortable or challenging, she is advising that the point be taken home. Sometimes truth is hard to take, but maybe that is what we have and we should take it as it is. Yeah. So without further ado, let's jump into this video, get to see what the sister has to share and then we shall do a critical analysis based on this video. So thank you to everyone who's engaged on my post about the enslaved fasting during the month of Ramadan. I knew that that part of Black American history was something that not a lot of people know, but I didn't realize just how much people did not know. And I knew that taking pride in my faith as a Black person and as a Muslim, that comments like these were coming. I knew that that post celebrating my ancestral hold onto the faith of Islam that I still practice to this day was going to cause people to talk about something that has nothing to do with what it is that I was talking about. And I want people to understand that when they say these things about Islam and about Christianity, that the only way that African people or black people came about those faiths was through forced conversion, that that is historically inaccurate. And so because y'all love my dad and I'm trying to get him over here on TikTok, I'm going to have him break it down for you. Okay, let's give it a try. Three minutes. There, for, for the record, there are three kinds of Arabs. There's one, the original Arab. They were commonly what you would call black. They are the descendants of Noah, the descendants of Ham, the descendants of Cush. They're called Cushites. They lived in the southern area of the peninsula connected to them and the kingdom of Cush, which extended in through what's commonly known today as Ethiopia. So you had the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula and Ethiopia where the Cushites reigned. They were the original Arabs. Secondly, there's the people who married into that particular grouping, that particular tribe, etc., they then become Arabs. Third, last but not least, or probably least, are what we, is now your modern Arab, your modern, what I would refer to as Euro-Arab, all right, because these are the people who, with the advent of Islam, began to come to the peninsula to meet the prophet, to find out about this Islam. Or these are people who resisted the Islam and fought against the Muslims and were conquered, were beaten. But they came out of places like Rome, Byzantium, uh, uh, Persia, uh, 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 Turkey, things like that. So they were eventually uh, subdued. Now, keep in mind the places I'm talking about, because I haven't mentioned Africa yet. But I will, because the Muslims go into Africa. They go into Africa, and who do they meet there to, to and, and engage? Because historians will tell you, some of them will, uh, Euro hist historians will say they invaded Africa. They didn't invade Africa. What they did was they liberated the black people in Africa from the Europeans who were controlling it. When I say Europeans, I'm talking about your Romans, etc. your Romans and your Byzantines. They controlled Egypt from... 100 years after Jesus Christ until they were kicked out by the Muslims in 634. The Muslims who went into there were black. The vast majority of them were what you would call black. And they were black Arabs. They were your Kushites. They moved the Europeans out of Africa. All right? These are the same uh, Arabs, black Arabs, who moved by 711 into Europe and controlled Europe for 800 years. They're commonly referred in history today as the Moors, all right? So there's part of your history. Last but not least, I'm trying to do this in three minutes. If someone is telling you that black people or that, that black people were forced into Islam, that Africans were forced into Islam, the history is that these Euro Arabs who are ushered into a slave trade that was that predates European slave trade by almost 600 to 800 years. They passed laws to make sure that Africans, so-called black people, could not convert to Islam. They were in total opposite with the original black Arabs who, during the time of the prophet, were in control of the Islam. So it went from being pro-black to anti-black by virtue of the same people who had gotten kicked out by these black people who had been in uh, under the heel of black people since the ancient Egyptians, since the ancient, uh, ancient Kushites, since the ancient, since Hannibal, since the ancient times. So all they were doing was putting their hatred 
into their Islam, onto the Islam. Because think about it. You pass a law so that the people could not convert because you want to keep them as slaves. If you convert them by the sword, then they become Muslims. And therefore, you can't keep them in slavery and you have to treat them like your brother. So what would be the purpose of converting them? You would eliminate your slavery. And only people who think as a way of absolving the European conquest of the world and their savagery ask you that question. It's called what aboutism. It's what white people do all the time. When you hear a black person do it, that's just a white thinking black person. It's kind of, that's, you know, that's what blackface was all about. So I hope that. Now, you know, it's very important and it's very profound that this a Muslim girl, she's an Arab, and she's able to explain her experiences as an insider about the injustices she sees happening. Now, 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 wait. Let me correct one thing. Not all Arabs are Muslims, and not all Muslims are Arabs. You understand? We understand that uh, Muslim or the Islam uh, religion uh, was rooted from Arab, but not all Arabs are Muslims. We have Arabs who are Christians as well. I have seen for myself. And also, we have Muslims who are not Arabs. We have Africans who are Muslims. Now, despite uh, being an Arab or being a Muslim, racism is being faced by black people. Whether you are a Muslim or not, you will have to face this racism. And this woman, she's explaining racism on the perspective of religion and on the perspective of uh, being uh, ashamed, being prejudiced, facing discrimination against uh, him or herself uh, from the Islamic culture and the Arab people as well. Now, it's good that you keep the difference between two. Not all Arabs are Muslims. Not all Muslims are Arabs. And I think that we should go to the root of this problem of racism. We should find the root because there's always a reason for everything to happen, a good reason and the true reason. Now, here's what we can discover about um, the problem. It's always good to find the source. Here at EFK, we find sources to problems we see happening around. Let's have a glance, a glimpse of the slave trade that happened in the East African coast between the Africans and the Arabs. The history of Arab slave in the East African coast is a complex and often overlooked. Uh, it's an overlooked chapter in the history, on the broader history of the transatlantic slave trade. We don't mention that. We always forget it. So it's overshadowed. First thing is the origin and the context of the Arab slave trade. Over several centuries, countless East African East Africans were sold as slaves by Muslim Arabs. This trade route connected East Africa to the Middle East and other regions via the Sahara Desert and the Indian Ocean. Now, there was also another, route, another trade that was taking place within the Sahara. It was called the Trans-Sahara Trade Route. The Trans-Sahara Trade Route, the main commodity was salt. Apart from salt, Another commodity was the slaves. It's like people, were, people loved selling themselves. Or people loved selling people, not selling themselves. People loved selling people for money in the days of the past. I'm glad that we are living in the days that it's against the constitution all over the world. Not just one place. It's objectively wrong today. Now the practice of selling African slaves by the Arab traders dates back to antiquity, but gained prominence in the 17th century when Islam was spreading in North Africa. This was, a long, this was long before Europeans explored the continent or West Africans were forcibly taken across the Atlantic to the Americas. We can learn that the slave trade of the Arabs is even older than the transatlantic slave trade. We only know about the transatlantic slave trade because it's what we get in the mainstream media. Now, there's a special country, or rather an island. It's not really a country, but it's part of a country. Zanzibar. Zanzibar is an island in Tanzania. Zanzibar, an, uh, an island that is now part of Tanzania, played a central role in this trade. It was considered the hub of the East African slave trade. 
And by the way, there was this um, ahead of Muslims. His name was Sultan. Uh, there's one particular Sultan whose name was uh, Sayyid Said. Uh, he's the one who brought Arabs to Zanzibar. The Arabs we have in Zanzibar are the descendants of Sayyid Said and his crew. Remember that uh, Sayyid Said located, he migrated from Muscat and he went all the way to Muscat, to Zanzibar because apart from trading humans, he, also, he was also finding for an arable piece of land where he could uh, practice his agriculture. And the things he was practicing agriculture uh, was something we call gloves, cloves, cloves, yeah, cloves, not gloves. Now, the slave trade routes and practices. Arab Muslims in North and East Africa captured Africans and sold them to the Middle East. These enslaved Africans worked as field laborers, teachers, or harem guards. Castration of male slaves was common. Now, the, the Arabs did not want the black gene to be spilled all over their country. They wanted the work, but they didn't want the seed of the black people. <laughs> it's like I say, I like your head, but I don't like your legs. Or rather, I like your legs, but I don't like your head. No, 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 no. You can't say you like a part, you don't like the other. A part is never greater than the whole. The whole is greater than the part. So, you saying that you don't like my seeds, but you don't like my work, you are lying to me, you are hypocritical. And this is what Arabs were showing Africans back then. The Africans who were busy selling other Af Africans were no exceptions. If the Arabs ran out, if perhaps they ran out of slaves, they would go for those people who are selling these other people. No, there was no love because they don't want your seed. They see, ah, no, we don't want this black seed here. It's, no, it's bad, it should go away. That was what they thought. Otherwise, why would they castrate Africans? Tell me why. And it's, it is believed that it was common. I did a video on that, actually. So interestingly, Islam's Islamic uh, legal views prohibited the enslavement of Muslims, including African Muslims. However, this did not prevent the widespread enslavement of non-Muslim Africans. Remember, by the uh, beginning of the video, I told you that um, Prophet Muhammad married a woman whose name was Bilal. Bilal was, an, was a freed slave. He might, she might be an African. She might have been an African and she was, because she was a freed slave. And my research says that these slave traders who were Arabs captured African non-slave, Africans who were non-Muslims, and they made them slaves. Before that, they even made Africans who were Muslims slave trade. That was until the Islamic religion openly rebuked it. You understand? So Muhammad marrying Bilal was a sign that slave trade has no part in the Islamic religion. I think slavery has no part meant enslavement of Muslims, but not the enslavement of non-Muslim. It might have meant that. Let me put it right. Now, Arab traders encountered existing structures in Central East Africa where ethnic groups like the Yao, Makua, and Marava engaged in capturing and trading people through wars. These existing practices facilitated the Arab slave trade. The, the, the Africans made it easier for other Africans to be sold out. Now, what were the economic motivations that made the Arabs sort out Africans for slave trade? First is this. The slave trade was intertwined with other economic activities. Ivory was highly sought after, and slaves were used as porters to transport it. Zanzibar, with its bustling markets, Zanzibar, with its bustling markets, became a hub for slave auctions. Arab Muslims sought slaves for various purposes, including working on clove farms. Cloves being another valuable commodity. Remember I told you about Said Said. He moved from Muscat to Zanzibar and he was moving there for 
the climate in Zanzibar was uh, was good it was not as hot as the one you have in 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 the arab nations so he moved to Zanzibar where it was cooler he could uh, he could feel nice while he was in Zanzibar Zanzibar also had good soil the soils were very very uh, uh were doing well with cloves cloves was a major cash crop back then and so because there were huge plantations they needed the workers on those plantations where else would they find the workers if not on the mainland Tanzania and the mainland Kenya and the mainland East Africa East African coast that is where they went and it was facilitated by fellow Africans so if we are giving judgment to slave traders who were Arabs we should give judgment to slave traders who are Africans as well they should share the same punishment now what is the legacy of this forgotten history because nobody talks about the you know the indian ocean trade or the arab slave trade nobody talks much about it today as we speak zanzibar is known for its white sandy beaches and crystal clear waters attracting tourists around the world however its dark past as a slave trading center is often overshadowed another thing is that while the transatlantic slave trade on the west coast of africa is more widely uh, discussed the activities of arab slavers on the east african seaboard persisted for several decades longer until they were officially outlawed it still happened until the government after government after government came and said no uh, let's put an end to this let's introduce a new thing the new thing we are going to introduce is called colonialism so slavery paved the way for colonialism still a form of slavery if you ask me in summary the arab slave trade in east africa left a lasting impact on the region's history culture and demographics It's essential to acknowledge this forgotten chapter and learn from it. If you'd like more about and to learn from it. If you'd like to understand why Africans are still going to the place where people are enslaving their ancestors. It's because of finding a better opportunity in life. That's the only reason. Otherwise, people would not go back there. people would really not go there because many africans are done very bad things by those arabs it's 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 not a good face it's a really bad shape uh, it's it's really not good what's happening over there so people should learn from history i always say learn from history don't repeat history repeating history might be catastrophic always learn from history itself yeah Now um I'm going to end the video here. I hope that we we'll find value from uh, sister Thabti uh from uh, her experiences and uh, let the people who practice or people who think they are better than Africans learn that they'll come an end to this one day. An end to this colorism will one day come. And it's not far from happening. It's very soon. It's very very soon. When the Lord returns things will go back into shape on how they are supposed to be god did not create a racist world he didn't do that he is such a good god he can't do such a thing in him is holiness there is nothing which is unholy that can penetrate yeah so if you like my videos kindly give a super thanks subscribe give a comment share your thoughts i'll so much appreciate give a super thanks it helps me bring you good content here yeah. see you in the next one this is evans from kenya original documentaries